Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please make your way back to your seats. Welcome back. Okay. So we we're at uh, good time so far today. We'll definitely end on time, but I do want to make sure that we have uh, uh, you know the right amount of uh, summary discussion a little bit later. So I'd like you to think about something that you've learned in the last two days, something that you've learned, or something that uh, that maybe is just novel or unique for you. Uh, something that maybe you'll take back into the laboratory, that you'll try, that you'll experiment. Maybe you're going to uh, uh, try to calculate a sigma performance metric, uh, something like that. Be thinking about uh, something, and, and, and if you want to share during our summary time, uh, we'll have opportunity to do that, because we'll go through a little bit about each of the presentations that we had and, and uh, allow ourselves time to reflect on our, our time together. So we'll start with a few questions uh, before our last session on point of care testing. Uh, this is opinion. Should point-of-care testing have unique standards and or regulations for QC? Okay. Yes. Overwhelmingly. What is the most critical quality challenge in point of care testing? Operator competency, that's interesting. So we had a session about personnel competency uh, yesterday, right? And so this is uh, coming up as, as a top critical quality challenge in point of care testing. At the present time, who is heading point of care management in your organization? This is at the present time. Few more. Okay. The point of care coordinator. This next question is for better or for improvement in the future, who should be heading point of care management in your organization?
and we have alignment between what's happening now and what we think should happen, mostly. It was an interesting thing in the United States as point of care was becoming uh, really popular in the early 2000s and late, late 90s. There was a move to decentralize the responsibility and then, um, and then the uh, central lab decided that they wanted to take it back and then they decentralized again and then as risk and liability became a concern, they would kind of do this, this back and forth thing, so it's interesting. So in this next session, uh, point of care daily and routine quality control and point of care test settings, we have um, uh, two speakers. The first is Professor Giuseppe Lippi. He's a director of laboratory at Academic Hospital at Parma and chairman of the scientific division, Italian Society of Clinical Biochemistry and a noted and accomplished author of the subject. Welcome. Thank you. First of all, let me thank you, Bio, rather, for inviting me to this meeting, and especially Gianni, who was very kind to brought me here. So um, I saw that you have already answered to some of the questions that I will show you throughout my presentation. But first of all, I would like to uh, give a, a cumulative answer to two main questions in uh, terms of point of care testing. Uh, which is the pointer? The green? The pointer? Ah, great, thanks. So, first of all, why should we establish a quality control if point of care testing? But the, 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 the latter question is somehow related to the, to the former because how can be the situation with no quality control? So, if we can demonstrate that the situation with no quality control is detrimental, so we automatically answer to the first question. I will show you some uh, personal experience that we had in Italy and uh, um, as usually, Italy is downregulated for everything, from the prime minister to uh, the, the public uh, laboratories. So uh, the, the downregulation system of Italy means that actually uh, point of care testing has no uh, any kind of control. Uh, there is no regulation. It is not under the responsibility of anyone. It just run. So the situation is like that. We, have, uh, uh, we shipped simply some samples uh, in uh, a public laboratory uh, that run the point of care testing and in three uh, out uh, pharmacies outside uh, um, the hospital in the territory of Parma where I live. And this is the situation. So this is the um, performance of the point of care testing in uh, the laboratory compared to the performance of the quality specification and this is the performance of the outside pharmacies. But it is even more challenging when we go through the numbers of the pharmacies and we can see that even uh, across the pharmacies, the performance were not aligned. So there was some pharmacies that were performing rather, uh, let's say, uh, satisfactory other pharmacy that would perform really bad. But going back to the other slides, uh, uh, the, the problem that we have to face is that actually we have problems in uh, uh, point of care testing, which are uh, in terms of prevalence rather different from, uh, um, let's say, the conventional clinical chemistry testing. Because if you go through in your mind and remember which are the main causes of uh, errors in clinical chemistry, we do know that the main problems are pre-analytical and post-analytical phase. But in point of care testing, the situation seems somehow different. Actually, we don't know if the situation is really different or we don't know because uh, we don't identify preanalytical problems. You know that we are running, in most cases, whole blood, and we don't know what's in whole blood, if it is emolized or lipemic or icterics or whatever else. What we, we do know, however, is that uh, Errors in point of care testing are detrimental for patient safety because as you can see in this score from one which is the lowest to five which is the highest risk for the patient we have up to 20% of probability of doing some sort of harms to our patients and 3.6% possibility chance likelihood of doing a serious harm to our patients if we encounter an error in point of care testing. So the automatic answer is that we need some help and uh, 
this help comes or may, may come from the establishment of a reliable system of quality assessment. This is a typical example. I, I just took this one from the literature, but the, the, there are several other examples throughout the world. When an equal external quality assessment for lipid screening in pharmacy has been established, and as you can see, the performance of the pharmacies, these are all pharmacies, were all within the expected range other than two, which is a rather different picture from that, that I show you in my previous slide. So, we, now we do know that indeed uh, quality control in uh, point of care testing is needed. But the problem is how, when, and by whom should it be run? I um, uh, should tell you that uh, there are no, uh, at, at variance with uh, clinical chemistry or hematology or uh, um, coagulation testing, there are not so fixed rules for running a quality assessment for point of care testing. There are rather different realities. Matthias Nauck will show you afterwards the reality in Germany. So I will talk basically on the um, most important document that, uh, that, are, uh, that are now available on this topic. And indeed, the, the, probably the foremost document is the ISO um, uh, 22870, which established that the management of laboratory service, so this is the answer to the second question that you were uh, administered before, uh, there is no point of care coordinator that should be in charge of the point of care, but rather is the management of the laboratory that should be in charge of the point of care, and it should demonstrate the conformity of testing to the quality system and continually improve the effectiveness of quality management system. How and when should it be run? Well, the laboratory director uh, should validate the following process for service provision. It should use the quality control for verify accuracy and linearity. And uh, should also, um, this kind of verification should also use in multiple sites. So it's not enough to do quality control on one instrumentation. You should run quality controls on all instrumentation available in your facilities. Another important aspect is the frequency of internal quality control should be specified for each device. Actually, we don't have any uh, strict rules or strict limit for performing point of care quality testing, for performing qual quality control in point of care testing. This, as I will show you later on, is dependent on several parameters. Corrective action should be taken as it will, uh, as it should, um, corrective action taken for non-conformity QC results, which, which should be clearly documented, should be absolutely recorded for regular review by the quality manager or a designate. A process control for consumer supplies and reagents shall be documented and monitored, and, and uh, least but not last, uh, uh, the, uh, when there are some wards performing inpatient uh, testing with point of care, also these wards should be clearly monitored by the laboratory staff. The uh, guidelines recommendation of the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry are somehow different from those of the ESO because they, it is a scientific association rather than an international organization. So, um, uh, um, quality assessment program for laboratory, laboratory services should be established to establish the performance expectation, the cover. Uh, this is very important, pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical components. So it's not important to monitor only the analytical phase, but it should be expanded throughout the total testing process. This expectation should be clearly established after consultation with user physician and other healthcare workers, which means all the stakeholders of our services. There should be established a periodic audit to determine that the service is meeting the established performance expectation. A program of performance comparison should be established with the um, central or core laboratory. A periodic review of the service pattern for practice against established validity and standard benchmark should be established. And finally, um, all these aspect of, aspects of quality assessment should be clearly reviewed by a management team. What about the internal quality uh, control requirements? Uh, it should be a procedure which is established at the appropriate frequency. There, there should be clear indication about which material is going to be used for the quality control of point of care testing. And uh, um, clear rules should be established to verify the correction of nonconformity and the 
the action undertaken to correct these non-conformities. Non Finally, the use of point of care testing, and this is clear, very clearly expressed in this document, have a duty to participate in an external quality assessment scheme and perform adequately as part of the clinical governance. We know that in several states of the USA, of the US, the CLIA has a very, very strict regulation according to point of care testing, and which is very clear, very similar to that of the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry or um, the ESO. And in most cases, these regulations are also proficiency testing, which means that if the pharmacy or whatever other facility is running point of care testing is not accomplishing the, uh, or fulfilling the criteria, then testing would not be allowed anymore in that facility. Uh, I like very much this paper from Cameron Martin because he uh, actually divided um, the um, quality control uh, for point of care according to the type of the instrument because we know that we can have very different type of instrumentation in, uh, in our facility. Laboratory type that are instruments used in a point of care environment, uh, environment like full size blood gas analyzer and column um, glycosylide hemoglobin analyzer. Cartridge based which are uh, more and more widespread especially in, uh, in Europe uh, like <coughs> those instruments used for blood blood gas analysis and again for glycosylate hemoglobin or analysis of anticoagulant therapy and finally the strip based instruments the glucosimeter glucometers that are commonly used by also patient for um, auto monitoring of uh, uh, glucose so what about the program for for um, full size laboratory derived analyzer this would be uh, technically more strict uh, has, um, and more stringent than for um, cartridge-based instruments and is based on multi-level daily QC samples combined with regular quality external assessment samples and entailing a rigorous preventive um, management program. What about the cartridge instrument? This should be actually fixed to um, troubleshoot two kinds of problems. The technical problems, mechanical programs of the analyzer and the cartridge. So for the cartridge, the QC should be checked on delivery and uh, should be based on multi-levels of the manufacturers or a manufacturer recommended QC materials. Actually, different lot numbers and cartridge types should be checked separately in the delivery because we are not sure that one cartridge will perform exactly as another one. Um, what about the technical functionment of the analyzer? This should be uh, mm, typically um, verified with manufacturer's electronic QC cartridge. When this is not uh, available, an additional uh, sample should be run to um, supply uh, this lack. Uh, mm, a quality assessment sample is run at least monthly on uh, at least one analyzer within a specific group. For strip-based system, the strips are checked at delivery and every day of analyzer use are checked with multiple levels of manufacturer's recommended quality control materials and manufacturer rec recommended or a third party, I, I would say that it probably is better a, a third party external quality ass assessment sample is run at least monthly on every analyzer at the site. If the instrument is not equipped with, equipped with automatic onboard QC, intelligent QC and internal checks, then the personnel should be in charge on rescheduling regular quality assessment. Uh, an alternative to external quality assessment, and this is also uh, a call for Biorad to establish probably, uh, I, I know that you don't have a, a brochure for quality assessment in point of care test, but th this should be done actually, and uh, it's a suggestion, a kind of suggestion, gratis, free, so, and uh, an alternative, uh, well, if you can't use uh, actually uh, an external quality assessment based on lyophilized material or whatever other type of material available in your, in, in your laboratory is to split or use parallel patient sample. Like external quality, quality assessment, it provides a delayed external check of quality, so it's not real time, but it's delayed. Uh, the test utilizes uh, um, an identical uh, matrix as the sample that you are running uh, from the patient. It can be a cost-effective external assessment of quality, and we sample equivalent to routine specimen, it can check the pre-analytical component of testing. By, sh by whom it should be run? Well, the, the answer is absolutely inherent to the question. It should be run by everybody who is actually using the point of care testing. The final, uh, uh, the two final slides are uh, 
actually um, uh, involve the pre-analytical phase. As, uh, as uh, uh, I saw that uh, most of you have indicated as the, 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 the right answer uh, about the leading challenge in point of care test in the analytical phase. This is probably true, but we shouldn't really forget that we have still problem in the pre-analytical phase. For instance, we carried out this study last year and we uh, centrifuge all the blood gas analysis sample that we have received in our laboratory and out of uh, more than 1,000 samples, we identify 1.2 samples with various degrees of hemolysis, but there was a problem. The point of care testing was still in the emergency department, so this number was predictably uh, underestimated. And in fact, we perform an identical analysis in another center in Verona rather than in Parma, where the, uh, the emergency department has not a dedicated point of care testing. And as you can see, the numbers are quite different because the, uh, the, mm, the mm, percentage of uh, hemolytic sample, hemolyzed sample coming from the emergency department are as high as 6%. But still, we could identify that also uh, an average of 11% sample and 13% sample had problem of lipemia and uh, uh, icterus. So this means that when we establish a real quality control, quality assessment of point of care testing, we should not really forget that we have, we have to target also the pre-analytical phase. Thanks for your attention. Right. <laughs> that was fast and uh, information packed, and I got a tip, thank you, um, that I'll take back. Uh, next we have uh, Professor uh, Matthias Snook, uh, Head of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine at University Hospital in Greifswald. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to this interesting meeting and I will slow down my speed and now it's, we are starting with our last uh, talk in this um, meeting. Um, I don't know how many people are aware uh, when they visited Cologne the first time. In the morning of this day we heard a lot of about accreditation and here are some personal comments. As you already heard, I am working in Greifswald and here the certification of birth of my mother. She is born in Greifswald. And on the right hand side, there's my certification of birth, like accreditation, and I'm born in Cologne about 50 years ago. So we can continue with uh, the future in point of care testing. When we are talking about point of care testing, it's a common international term but it's not a real part of the real back. We have a different wording, um, like patient near testing. In our German, we already heard about the dean ESO norm for POCT, and overall, there are many definitions. And some of these definitions are summarized by the CAP, and they take some geographical aspects into account. Is it an emergency case unit? Is it in, performed in home care? They look for functional aspects, how long is the turnaround time. They look for technological um, aspects. And of course, the users play an important role in this POCT area. The summarize of the um, ASCC POCT from 2006, I can read for the definition, POCT is defined as clinical laboratory tests, testing conducted close to the site of patient care typically by clinical personnel whose primary training is not in the clinical laboratory sciences or by patients, self-testing. POCT refers to any testing performed outside of the traditional core or central laboratory. I think um, in general we can agree to this type of definition, but we have to be careful that POCT is not POCT. I don't know how many people had the opportunity to look at the really back. Here is your opportunity, the choice. This is the first page of the really back. Um, we are handled in Germany. And there are some aspects according to patient near testing. POCT is not included, as I already mentioned. And there are some aspects. Patient near testing has easy to perform. We, do not, we are not allowed in patient near testing to perform any sample preparation like centrifugation. It is important that we take immediate therapeutic evidence from the results from the POCT analysis 
and it's forbidden to perform any batch analysis, which might be quite difficult when we look at the blood gas analyzers which are available currently on the market. In the German Rudebeck, we have the English expression unit use reagentien or translated reagents. It means that we have uh, perform only single measurements um, portioned reagents, so we are not allowed to perform measurements from one reagent lot um, to many patients, and one patient per patient has to be performed during these analyses. And here are some of the strips analyses we are performing in POCT or patient near testing. When we compare our uh, minimum frequency of internal QC, we, uh, according to our core lab, at least we have to perform QCs within 24 hours per analyte and device. And in POCT, we have a different rule. I don't know if it's acceptable, but we have this rule at least once per week per analyte and device. So there's a huge difference in the uh, reader back according to core lab analysis and the POCT analysis. And here's uh, one of our charts for core lab glucose measurements. We have the target value, we have the coefficient of variations, and I think it seems to be acceptable. And these are similar data from the POCT glucose. The values for the CVs are quite comparable, but of course the number of um, quality control measurements are much lower. Once per week is much lower than two per day. When we overall look according to the analytical performance of more or less um, state-of-the-art POCT instruments, we choose glucose as the analyte, and on the x-axis there is a core lab um, glucose measurements, on the y-axis there is a POCT glucose measurements. Uh, we perform this analysis using EDTA plasma from spare material, and as you can see from the regression equation, it looks very good. So the analytical performance is absolutely comparable between core lab analytes and POCT instruments, but of course we have to be careful. POCT is not POCT and the devices have huge analytical differences, but there are instruments available which have a very good performance. And one of these devices, as you can see here with a superior test strip, just for glucose, but there are four measurement units on this test strip. The first measurement unit, there are all these specific enzymes for glucose measurements, that's okay. And the next um, chamber there, we detect unspecific reactions, so the specific enzyme for glucose determination is skipped, so that we can corrugate or co correct for the um, unspecific reactions. There are the third measurement where the hematocrit is really measured, so we really determine the plasma glucose determination. And at the end of the test strip, there is a control if was enough uh, sufficient material um, applied to this test strip. So this glucose determination seems, from my point of view, um, in part better than the glucose determination we perform in general in our core lab. One of the uh, main issues where we could use POCT glucose measurements is for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. And here are the criteria for the two hour value for overall glucose tolerance test in millimole per liter. So the values um, are between 7.8 and 11.1 millimole per liter. And we performed um, a lot of glucose tolerance test and compared the results from the core lab instrument and the POCT instrument and here the correlation which is quite similar to the from the EDTA plasma samples and even if we look at the more uh, into the detail into the concentration which is relevant for the diagnosis the similar the data are not perfect but they are quite good and when you compare two core lab analyzers for glucose determination, the picture could be the same. So the quality of the POCT analytes can be very good. As you already heard, which are other aspects for the quality um, in POCT measurements, the training of all users is one of the most important, um, as you already answered in the, one of the questions. 
the measurement techniques of the devices has to be taken into account, and I will show the efficient monitoring with IT tools, and of course, um, one of the topics for BioRed, the stability and the quality of QC materials for POCT testing can be improved. Here is one of our guidelines uh, where we train all our users and the University Hospital of Greifswald overall has about 3,500 co-workers and uh, nearly 50% of these people are trained for our glucometer. So this training um, takes a real amount of resources and the performance of the instrument is very important and the training takes our capacity. Here are some of the instruments which are available which allow our connectivity to the laboratory information system. And when we have one of these POCT devices, um, we have the results, we have some comments, we have the username, uh, which is very important, and then the data are transferred to a middleware, then it's transferred to the laboratory information system, and then it's transferred to the hospital information system, and then the information goes backwards with a patient name so that the data are really transferred to the um, electronic patient record. Of course, we, in general, we do not have only one POC device, uh, there are several others, and sometimes it's difficult if you use POC devices from different companies. You have one middleware, and you need another middleware, and a third middleware, which makes it quite complicated to, to look at the data because you have to always learn a different um, aspect on your computer. So I wish that these middlewares can be concluded, or it might be better if the middleware would be implemented in the laboratory information system so that we are able to look at the data as you are able to look at the data in your core lab. Another aspect we have to take into account is the QC materials for external quality assessment. And I showed that for internal quality control, the Rudebeck shows or has different criteria for core lab analysis and for POCT analysis. This is not this, um, for the external quality. Here we have our reference method values for glucose, and there we have an acceptance level of 15%, and this is guilty for the core lab analysis as well as for the POCT analysis. The really back just lists analytes independent of the um, measurement of these analytes. So there's no extra definition for POCT devices. When we look at glucose and our external quality assurance schemes, glucose measurements is performed quite well in the core labs, and the um, quotes um, are more than 98, 97% of the core labs which take part in these external quality schemes. When we look at POCT, these data look a little bit different, and we are still searching for a suitable material for these aspects. Here we performed, um, or we looked at the data from, from Instant, and, uh, which is performing the external quality assurance for glucose in Germany in parallel to the um, DGKL. And here we see this square, these red lines, um, all the data which are in between this square, they're okay, and all other are not okay. So when we look at the success rates and we um, measure from these samples the reference method value, the acceptance rate is between 25 and 45 percent. So that's an awful result and therefore the EQA for POCT glucose is from my point of view currently not really um, performable. As a second choice, we have the opportunity to use the consensus values, um, so the acceptance rate uh, climbs up to 90%, but from my point of view, it's a, a very artificial um, value, which might be acceptable for the laboratories to receive their certificate, but overall, it's no real external quality assurance. Coming back to these data, um, we are trying to separate these groups according to the manufacturers. And here, 
two examples. On the left-hand side, you see these data are more or less in between the criteria, so we have devices which can be checked uh, with our current EQA QC materials. <coughs> On the right-hand side, this is one manufacturer with different devices, and some of these devices work fine according to the scheme, and other are not able to detect um, the glucose concentration, um, which is comparable to the reference method value. So in the current situation, we are looking for different commercial available QC materials, and we tried to um, check these different QC materials with a lot of different devices, all for glucose measurements, and you see um, some white spots. In these cases, we did not get any result, and you receive a lot of red spots, and in this situation, the target value and the value we measured with these combinations was uh, bigger than 15%. And um, as you can imagine, it was about 50%, it was, it was about 100% and even higher. And there, um, about 40% of the uh, spots are colored in green. And in this combination, we are in between the 15%, which are stated in the relay back. So it might be a way to check the external quality scheme using different QC materials, which are all ready available, and combine it correctly with the expected devices. But of course, this was done with one lot of each of the test strips and the control materials. Um, if we repeat it, it might be that the colors green and red have to be exchanged totally. So we cannot be sure that this um, will really work. We have to look more in detail into these data. So I come to the end. The definition of POCT is heterogeneous. The analytical quality of POCT and CoreLab can be comparable. Of course, this is not for all the devices the truth. The main factor is to qualify the users on the wards. The IT connected TV contributes to the quality in POCT so that you can talk with the people on the wards if there are um, some problems. And the EQA is currently not solved for glucose in whole blood. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, I know there has to be some questions or comment about point of care. Dr. Fuentes, that's right, second row. I have a, a collateral question for you. The collateral question is, uh, do you know if has been published some study comparing the internal quality control rules from Wesgar and the internal quality control rules from Rillybeck? No such a publication. I, I don't know such a publication, so uh, a direct comparison of these two rules. But it, it would be a very interesting question. It seems that there is not exist, and it's very surprising because it is a very, very, very important matter. I am very surprised. In internet, nothing. In the, uh, it's not possible to find it. Yep. <laughs> Niels. Thank you both for the clear presentations. Um, I have a question um, about your thoughts. Um, what would be the responsibility of the manufacturers of uh, point of care devices um, if the the, the user performance or the user competency is such a problem, um, are these products really fit for purpose? Um, we should realize that it, this is a little bit of a push market and the devices were originally um, uh, designed for use on oil platforms or military field hospitals or ambulances or whatever. Um, circumstances where there's no central laboratory or core laboratory uh, available. Um, and it's not our responsibility, but I have great worries about proper use on an oil platform 
if we alone heard the, 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 the experience in, in our own, uh, own hospitals. So what do you think about resp responsibility of the manufacturers um, relating to user competency and fit for purpose? Um, from my point of view, uh, we have a real problem in, in the, the home care area. Um, the um, companies offer, of course, uh, some type of internal QC materials, but this is a more or less artificial world. And um, when we uh, take into account that we are, have patients and patients with the diabetes mellitus and they are chew the amount of insulin which they will inject in the next few minutes, um, from my point of view, it would be very helpful if these instrument, these devices from these patients in home care could really be checked by a sufficient material so this patient can get this material, he can analyze it and maybe the result will be 8 millimole per liter or whatever and then he sees, okay, I am able to handle this device as it should be and I know the result is okay. In the current situation, he has to believe the result on, on the device, but he is, has no real chance to, to check it in his real life, and therefore he will take his insulin doses as assumed by this device. But we know that many of these devices will have problems, and of course, the handling of the device might be problematic. Maybe the storage of the uh, test strips was wrong, um, performed by this individual patient and therefore the overall quality of these glucose determinations in the current situation is critical and it's really hard to prove that the results of these devices are correct. I have another idea. Uh, I was supervisor of the anticoagulant clinics for years uh, when, I, when I was in Verona. And we had several of these point of care testing uh, running on some patients. And the best quality control was the patient itself. I mean, in the morning, we asked them at least one, once every three months to get into the lab, have their blood checked with the, the point of care. And then in the same moment, the blood was drawn. And so we compare the, the results of the point of care testing. We have done this for 10 years, and I guess that only once uh, we had the problem with the point of care not performing as the, as the um, uh, the laboratory, and the problem was the laboratory, the sample was hemolytic. So, I mean, th this doesn't mean that we shouldn't really do it, but right. probably in my idea, the best quality control is the patient itself, because when we ship uh, something to the point of care, it's not the, the same uh, clinical aspect that we want to seek. Uh, we don't want to have uh, only analytical quality, we want to have clinical quality. So the instrument must perform, but the, the clinical result must be the same either matrix we are using. So uh, even the, the blood of drop, the, 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 the drop of blood or the, the, the venous blood. So I'm, I'm interested in, um, especially in the, uh, the informatics part of this and how it's getting into the LIS and, and you talked about the connectivity. In the, in the test report and in the patient record, are, is, it, is it noted that the result was derived from a point-of-care instrument? Um, yes, typically? We, we, yes, we, we sign it. Uh, it's, it's a different sheet you, you can look at in, in the laboratory information and hospital information system. It's clearly stated as POCT measurement. Okay, and the clinicians have been educated to understand the difference? Yes. Yeah, I think that's an important, important deal. Rob? Thank you very much for your presentations. And I agree very much to uh, the last thing you said on the control of the meters using the patient or in, in the hospital at the same way. We, in the Netherlands uh, until now, we don't use quality control materials since we don't know how to make the quality control materials. These instruments are meant to use fresh whole blood and, and it is hardly possible to make good uh, and stable quality control. So I wonder, um, how do you do that? Uh, uh, we in the Netherlands, we set up, we are setting up now a system of controlling the meters using the laboratory by, or the meters come to the laboratory, or patients come to the laboratory, and at the same time, so just as as Lip just said, that I, I think that should be the system. Use material from a Dutch company. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other comments or questions for the panel?
Thank you, gentlemen.